What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, hi, how are you? My name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on my makeup. So if you're into makeup or you're interested in true crime or you happen to have an avid interest in both like I do, then maybe while you're here consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. You know, or not, whatever. I can't tell you what to do but I sure would like it if you did decide to stick around, subscribe, and become a part of the fun little community we're cultivating here. However, if you're not interested in the true crime and makeup thing, or if the sight of my naked face repulses you, don't worry because you can still learn everything there is to know about today's story by simply popping down to the description box where, because I'm an angel among us, I've made sure to list some other creators that have covered today's case in a way that hopefully you'll enjoy more. Please hold your applause. For I'm just a simple, benevolent YouTuber hoping to make your content consumption as simple and as enjoyable as possible. You're welcome. And now that I've taken care of all those typical housekeeping items, let's go ahead and get into today's case. All right, so today we're throwing it back a little, back to the mid-1900s, and I, for one, am pumped. Because if there is one thing about me, it's that I love to research a vintage or even an antique case, if you will. Obviously, I'm interested in true crime through any era, but there's just something so different and so fascinating about those cases that took place and especially that were solved before like modern day forensic practices came into play. The older cases, they... They just hit different. So when our sweet community member Alf requested I cover today's story, I started research on it that very same day. And while I'm on the topic of requests from you guys, I'm really sorry that I haven't done a requested case in so long, but surprise, surprise, I wasn't very good at keeping suggestions organized with who suggested them. And then I got overwhelmed trying to go back and piece everything together and then I just gave up. But because without you guys, there's no channel at all, I wanna make an effort to cover the cases that you guys request. So to do that, I created a case submission form type dealie, um, which I mentioned in a recent community post, but just in case you missed it. From now on, I'm gonna have it linked down in the description. That way, hopefully I can keep things more organized and just flowing more seamlessly. Other than that, let me stop yapping about this so I can finally start yapping about the teacup poisoner. Oh, and it's gonna be a long one, guys, so um, <laughs> buckle in. Graham Frederick Young was born on September 7th, 1947 in Neesden in Middlesex, England. He was the second child born to his parents, Margaret and Frederick Young, having been preceded eight years earlier by his sister, Winifred. But sadly, Graham would never really get the chance to know his mother, Margaret, because she tragically ended up passing away from tuberculosis when he was just three and a half months old. She developed a pretty gnarly respiratory infection when she was pregnant with Graham, and she just just never fully recovered. So when she contracted tuberculosis, I guess it was just too much for her body to handle and she passed away. And this completely rocked the young family because not only did Graham and Winifred lose their mother, but in a way they also kind of lost their father as well. Because shortly after Margaret's death, Frederick decided that he either couldn't or wouldn't raise the children by himself. So he sent Winifred to live with their grandparents and he sent Graham to live with an aunt and uncle. So they lost their mother to tuberculosis, their father gave them up, and in doing so, he also separated them from each other. So it's like Margaret died and the entire family crumbled to pieces, all before Graham was even one year old. And unfortunately, it really didn't get any better for him from there because in 1949, when he was just two years old, Graham developed a severe ear infection that required a really risky surgery to correct and his family claimed that he was just never the same after it. It's been theorized based on later findings that either the ear infection or the surgery itself may have resulted in some sort of damage to Graham's frontal lobe, but like I said, that wouldn't be discovered until years down the road. In 1950, when Graham was three, his father got remarried to a woman named Molly, and following these nuptials, Frederick scooped up Winifred and Graham from their respective homes and attempted to reunite his family. The problem was Graham had grown incredibly close to his aunt and uncle during his time with them and being all of a sudden separated from them and thrown into this completely unfamiliar family dynamic with his father, sister, and stepmother. Well, Graham 
he, he didn't adjust so good. He and his stepmother did not get along pretty much right from the start. So after the reconstructed Youngs moved into their new home in St. Albans, Graham immediately started to withdraw. He was quiet. He was a loner. He really didn't seem to have any interest in socializing with his peers. It was just becoming really obvious that he was having a difficult time settling into his new life. And to be fair, that's understandable. He was so little when he was taken in by his aunt and uncle that there was no way he could have remembered his life before them. So even though technically, yes, he was now back with his biological family, this little boy was still essentially plucked away from the only family he'd ever really known, then forced to move to a new place with three people who were basically complete and total strangers to him. I just cannot even imagine how traumatizing that must have been. So yeah, Graham was kind of odd. And as he got older, he only got weirder. Apparently, Graham was fascinated by and read almost exclusively about murder and murderers. Okay, I know what you're thinking, but Graham was doing this almost as soon as he learned how to read. So by like six or seven, even I was still fairly normal when I was that young. So let's move along because um, I definitely did not share Graham's next fascination, which was Hitler and Nazi Germany. Yes, by the time Graham was a teenager, he would developed a full-blown obsession with old Adolf, and he desperately tried to explain to anyone that would listen how misunderstood his, um, idol was. He also began studying the occult and trying to get some of the local children to participate in these, like, weird ceremony type things, one of which for sure involved the sacrifice of his stepmother's cat. And even though that is the only documented instance there is of Grant sacrificing an animal, supposedly there were a bunch of other neighborhood cats that went missing around the same time. So was it really the only instance? Probably not. Do we know for sure? No. Can we make a fairly decent assumption? I'd say so. Now, as far as school went, Graham was really smart. Like really, really smart and he did really well in school. So to reward his son for all of his hard work, Frederick eventually bought Graham a small at-home chemistry set. But what Fred didn't know was that this would very quickly become Graham's newest and most dangerous obsession. Graham became fascinated with not only chemistry, but also with toxicology and forensic science. But because these topics weren't widely explored in his school's curriculum, he would spend hours independently reading up on and studying these topics. And then to test his knowledge, uh, Graham would catch mice and attempt to poison them using a variety of different chemicals, all while carefully observing and documenting his findings. Sounds like a um, real mixed bag with this kid. And even though he was, just that, a kid. In April of 1961, by the time Graham was just 13 years old, he had taught himself so much about toxicology and chemistry that he was actually able to convince a local pharmacist that he was a 17-year-old student just looking to procure a few different dangerous chemicals like antimony, digitalis, arsenic, and thallium. All for, you know, innocent study purposes, of course. And to be fair, he kind of wasn't lying. He did intend to study these chemicals. He just most certainly would not be studying them in an innocent or safe or controlled laboratory setting. <laughs> no, no. Graham had every intention of poisoning people with these chemicals in order to study their reactions. Mind you, all of these substances are extremely toxic to humans, which Graham already knew, and I'd be willing to bet that he was also already very much aware of what the likely outcomes were going to be when they were ingested by a human. I think he just wanted to watch it happen to somebody firsthand, which is demented, but <laughs> would we expect anything less on my channel? So Graham gets his precious little bundle of poisons and he sets out to find his first victim, which ultimately ended up being a fellow classmate and <laughs> his only friend, a boy named Christopher Williams. Graham and Christopher spent a lot of time together, including eating lunch together every day. And Graham saw this 
standing lunch date as an opportunity. An opportunity that he gladly capitalized on when he began lacing Chris's lunch sandwiches with antimony. And within just a few hours of the first sandwich, Chris began vomiting and experiencing painful cramps. He came down with a severe headache. And these symptoms went on for weeks because every day at lunch, Graham would poison Chris's sandwich and then he would observe his symptoms. Doctors were completely dumbfounded as to what could possibly be causing Chris's symptoms, which by the way, had gotten so bad that he was completely bedridden. And honestly, that probably saved his life. Once he was bedridden and secluded at home, obviously Graham couldn't poison him anymore and his symptoms started to clear up and eventually he made a full recovery. But this was a big fat bummer for Graham because once Chris's condition worsened to the point that he wasn't coming to school anymore, obviously Graham couldn't closely monitor what his poisons were doing to him. Because of this little snafu, Graham actually gave up on trying to poison his peers or even strangers and decided to focus on those a little closer to home. And by closer to home, I mean within his home. Yep, 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 yep. He, um, he was now going to start poisoning his very own family. He put his new plan into action in November of 1961 when he laced his sister Winifred's morning tea with belladonna. And in case you're like me and you're not a fucking botanist, belladonna is a toxic, perennial, herbaceous plant whose roots, leaves, and fruits contain alkaloids like atropine, hyoscyamine, and scopolamine, <laughs> all of which are apparently extremely poisonous to humans in high doses. Thankfully, Winifred, who was only 22 at the time, only took a few sips of the tea before she decided that she thought it tasted weird and she dumped it out. But even so, shortly after drinking just that small amount of the poison tea, she started to feel lightheaded and she began to hallucinate. By the time she got to work, she was in such terrible shape that her boss told her she needed to go to the hospital immediately, which thankfully she did. And once she was at the hospital, it did not take her doctors and nurses long to recognize that she'd been poisoned. While the hospital staff assumed that she'd accidentally ingested some kind of poison plant, her father accused Graham pretty much right away of having something to do with his sister having been poisoned. To which Graham was like, absolutely not. She probably poisoned herself, just mixing up her shampoos and stuff in teacups. And Fred was like, oh, you know, I never thought of that. And then he just, you know, basically dropped the whole thing. And Winifred was never at any point suspicious of Graham. She did not think for one second that her brother could have possibly been responsible for what had happened to her. Now, even though Graham was able to convince his family that he didn't have anything to do with Winifred's poisoning, uh, his dad still told him that he needed to just stop messing with chemicals, which he totally did, more than anyone was aware of at the time. But my guy, didn't you buy this boy his first little chemistry set in the first place? I mean, sure, he didn't know what he was starting, but I don't know, I guess it's just ironic that he's like, son, you must immediately stop the hobby I got you started with. I think the actual quote was stop mess, or no, it was be careful messing with those bloody chemicals. Regardless though, it, it doesn't matter what he told Graham because <laughs> Graham did not listen. Nope. He already had his next victim all picked out, his stepmother, Molly. Now, I briefly mentioned earlier that Graham and Molly had a fairly contentious relationship, but to elaborate slightly, um, Molly was never really all that nice to Graham. She would destroy his toys and other belongings as a form of punishment. She locked him out of the house on multiple occasions, sometimes for hours at a time. Honestly, she just doesn't really sound like a very nice woman. And I'm not saying that means she deserves to be poisoned. I'm just saying that I'm actually fairly surprised that she wasn't the first member of the family that Graham tried to poison. She was the second though. He began lacing her food with small amounts of antimony in late 1961. Not enough to be fatal at first, but definitely enough to cause some really, really severe symptoms. Her hair fell out, she lost a ton of weight, and she suffered from constant debilitating back pain. 
Eventually, her ailments became concerning enough that she was taken to the emergency room where her doctors diagnosed her with a stomach ulcer and began treatment right away. And at first, her treatment seemed to work. While she was in the hospital, it appeared as though Molly was going to make a near full recovery. Little did she know that as soon as she returned home, her symptoms would not only swiftly return, but they would escalate very quickly. Which brings us to April 20th, 1962. It was Good Friday, so the Youngs had planned a special dinner and Graham decided that that evening's festivities would be the perfect time to poison Molly again. This time with thallium, which he put 1300 milligrams of into her dinner. Mind you, 15 milligrams is more than enough to kill a person, so yikes. She did manage to survive the night. However, when she woke up the following morning, April 21st, she was in pretty bad shape. Even so, she managed to push through some of her morning errands. However, by the time she returned home, she was struggling just to breathe. She made her way out into the backyard of their home, hoping that some fresh air might help her, but almost as soon as she got outside, she collapsed onto the ground and began screaming and writhing in pain. And that is exactly how Frederick discovered her moments later. Shocked and horrified, he ran over and he began trying to help her. And as he knelt down next to his dying wife, Fred looked up and noticed that this whole time, Graham had been staring at Molly through a window, watching her thrash around in pain with absolute indifference on his face. He seemingly could not have cared any less about what was happening to her. And as badly as I'm sure Frederick wanted to shake his son and ask him what the hell was wrong with him, he, he didn't have time. His main priority at that moment was getting his wife to a hospital as fast as he possibly could, which he did. However, after speaking to multiple doctors, no one could figure out anything to do to help Molly. No matter what treatments or medications they administered, Molly remained in inexplicable and excruciating pain until eventually she succumbed to her condition and passed away. And what's absolutely bananas about Molly's death is that no one suspected anything sinister had happened. Rather, it was incorrectly determined that her cause of death was a prolapsed cervical disc, which was believed to have been the result of a car accident she'd been in a year prior, but I don't know why they believed that she had been totally fine for a year and then all of a sudden she, you know, that it's beyond me. Molly was cremated the following day, thus destroying all remaining evidence of what Graham had done to her. And this whole situation made Graham feel incredibly powerful. The kid had just poisoned his stepmother to death and no one had even batted an eyelash of suspicion in his direction. Because of this, he had absolutely no plans of slowing down his experiments anytime soon. Shit, he literally poisoned his uncle's food at Molly's funeral, so he wasn't even gonna take like a mini break. His uncle was fine, he got pretty sick at the funeral, but as far as I could find, he managed to make it out the other side fairly unscathed. The same though cannot be said for Graham's next target. Any guesses? If you guessed Frederick, ding, 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 you're correct. Graham's next victim was in fact his very own father. But before we get into that, I'm going to take a quick break, throw on my lashes, and when we come back, parasite. Well, attempted parasite. Don't go nowhere. Did you miss me? So, Following Molly's death, Graham began poisoning every single one of Frederick's meals with antimony. Obviously, this greatly affected his health. He had near constant gastrointestinal issues and he began losing weight at a rapid pace. Eventually, his symptoms also took such a toll on him that he was admitted to the hospital. And as Graham sat at his father's side, listening to doctors attempt to figure out what was causing Fred's illness, he silently basked in the glory of the fact that he had caused the illness and that no one seemed to be able to figure out what it was. Even when the doctors did figure out that Fred had been poisoned, it still took him a while to pinpoint exactly what he'd been poisoned with, and Graham just loved feeling smarter than his father's doctors. He considered himself to be in like his own elite bracket of intelligence, far superior to his schoolmates, his family, and in this moment, these trained medical professionals. But what smarty pants Graham didn't seem to clock was that people 
were actually starting to get suspicious of him. His father was suspicious of him, his aunt was giving him the side eye, and his chemistry teacher, Mr. Hughes, had grown especially wary of him after he discovered some troubling drawings as well as multiple bottles of poison in Graham's desk. Really, Graham? We, um, couldn't think of anywhere better to hide that? Really thought the, uh, school desk was the best spot. Okay, so following this unsettling discovery, um, Mr. Hughes, together with the school's headmaster, arranged for Graham to meet with a psychiatrist. But the problem was that they knew if Graham knew he was meeting with a psychiatrist, he might not be totally transparent regarding his toxicology and chemistry knowledge. So what they decided to do was to have the psychiatrist pose as a career advisor that was interested in Graham specifically for his extensive knowledge. And after a little bit of, you know, light ego stroking at the beginning of the meeting, Graham opened up big time to this undercover psychiatrist, leaving him all but certain at the end of their interview that Graham had in fact been the one to poison his family members. Graham seemed to see the world as just one giant experiment and he had little to no remorse for what he'd done. So the psychiatrist called the police and relayed his suspicions and his findings to them and in turn, Graham was arrested. He was initially charged with the attempted murder of his father, his sister, and his friend, Chris. He tried really hard to deny having anything to do with their mysterious illnesses, but when police discovered that he had a small vial of antimony in his pocket at that very moment, well, the story started to kind of unravel. Eventually, he confessed to everything. Well, almost everything. The only thing that he did not take ownership of at that time was having murdered his stepmother. But even without that charge, he was still remanded to the Ashford Center to await trial. While in custody, Graham actually tried to, but he ended up surviving this attempt on his own life, which meant that he was alive and kicking when his trial did eventually roll around in July of 1962. Graham pled guilty to all the charges that had been brought against him, and he was ultimately sentenced to 15 years in Broadmoor, which is a wildly famous psychiatric hospital known for housing the criminally insane. Graham was eventually formally diagnosed by a prison psychiatrist as a psychopath, probably because he walked around talking about missing his poisons and the power they gave him. But you know, of course, this is just conjecture. Graham was actually one of the youngest inmates that Broadmoor had seen in a while, and he did not enjoy his new home. It was loud, it was crowded, and most of the activities throughout the day were communal. And as someone who considered themselves a loner, you know, Broadmoor just really wasn't his vibe. So he spent as much time as he possibly could alone in the library reading about poisons. I wish I was kidding. I'm at a loss for why literature like that is even allowed in an institution like that, but I digress. Now, even with Graham's valiant attempts to keep himself isolated from the other Broadmoor residents, there were still a select group of people that Graham decided he just didn't like. In particular, Graham absolutely loathed 23-year-old John Barrage because he snored. Yep, he even wrote about how much he hated John and his restricted airflow in letters that he mailed to his sister. Luckily, he wouldn't have to deal with John's snores for long because, coincidentally, less than two months after Graham took up residency at Broadmoor on August 6th, 1962, John suddenly died. I wonder how that happened. An autopsy later revealed that John had died of cyanide poisoning. I wonder how that happened. Officially, John's death was ruled as a suicide after police were unable to find any traces of cyanide anywhere within the facility. But even so, doctors and nurses and his fellow Broadmoor residents couldn't help but feel some suspicion towards Graham in the wake of John's death. Suspicion that, by the way, was totally warranted because Graham totally did poison John. He'd actually made his own cyanide poisoning out of leaves from laurel trees, which surrounded the Broadmoor property. And despite the fact that he literally broadcast to everyone that not only was this possible, but that he knew how to do it, 
Police still overlooked him as possibly being responsible for John's death, and no charges were ever brought against him. Graham was released from Broadmoor in February of 1971 after serving just under eight years of his 15-year sentence. He was released early after the prison psychiatrist determined that he was no longer obsessed with poisons, violence, and mischief, and that he was no longer a danger to others. Mind you, this he said of the convicted attempted murderer who spent almost a decade in this hospital reading about poisons, talking about poisons, and studying Hitler. Oh, and he was also overheard saying that when he got out, he was going to, quote, kill one person for every year he'd spent in there. So it was a really good call releasing him. Just way to go, Edgar. Oh, Edgar was the prison psychiatrist's name. I don't think I said that. Following his release, Graham moved in with his sister and her husband, and wouldn't you know it, uh, he almost immediately went out and tried to buy poison from a local pharmacy. Thankfully, he was denied because he didn't have the necessary, like, letter of authorization, but Graham, being ever resourceful as he was, somehow managed to forge a very convincing authorization letter from Bedford College. And the pharmacist, obviously not realizing that it was a fake letter, accepted it. And over the next few weeks, the pharmacist would provide Graham with large quantities of both antimony and thallium, his two favorite poisons. Which, by the way, he often referred to as his little buddies, because... He's a creep. And as Creepy Graham tried to camouflage himself back into society, he moved out of his sister's house and into a hostel where he began attending a vocational training course. And throughout his time at this hostel, Graham even managed to make a friend, a 34-year-old man named Trevor Sparks. The two men liked to hang out, hit the bars, and shoot the shit. You know, just manly things. But then, randomly, out of nowhere, Graham's new bestie, he, um... He got sick, like really sick. He was violently throwing up. He had explosive diarrhea. His legs were tingling. He was experiencing weird pain in his beanbag. Um, he just really was not doing well. And these symptoms came and went and came and went and came and went and came and went and came and went repeatedly over the next few months. And doctors were never able to determine exactly what was going on with Trevor. He ended up receiving a variety of miscellaneous diagnoses over the weeks that he was sick, from a kidney infection to a bowel infection to a urinary tract infection to a stomach infection. Lots of theories, lots of infection-based theories, but... Never once did any of these theories, at least that I'm aware of, cast any suspicion onto Graham. Who, by the way, was totally responsible for what was going on with Trevor, if that wasn't painfully obvious. He'd been poisoning him with antimony for weeks. Luckily, though, Trevor ended up leaving the hostel in April of 1971. And once he was away from Graham for long enough, his symptoms cleared up and he made almost a full recovery. Meanwhile, as Graham was finishing up his vocational training, he was required to you know, touch base with a psychiatrist as part of his probation. And the psychiatrist reported that Graham was doing super duper. He'd adjusted to life outside Broadmoor and he was just a blessing to society. To be fair, because he's a diagnosed psychopath, he was easily able to con others through lying and manipulating them into believing that he was a changed man. So I guess I won't drag all these psychiatrists that much, even though it was their literal job to see through his bullshit, but anyways, so Graham finishes his job training and secures a job as a shopkeeper at John Hadlin Laboratories, which was a photographic supply firm that manufactured thallium I er no thallium bromide thallium bromide iodide. Thallium bromide iodide infrared lenses for military equipment. Now, this was Graham's first job, and it it showed. His colleagues thought that uh, he was pretty weird. Some days he was super talkative and cheery. Other days he was quiet and withdrawn. He was just kind of unpredictable. But I mean, he was doing his job, so it just kind of was what it was. I mean, we've all had weird co-workers before, and if you haven't, it's probably you. You're the weird co-worker. Sorry. Now, Hadlin was aware that Graham had spent time at Broadmoor, but they weren't 
privy as to why he'd been there. And when they asked him, he told them that he'd had a nervous breakdown following losing his mother to a horrific car crash. And because they received references from Broadmoor singing Graham's praises and claiming that he'd been fully rehabilitated, they hired him. And unbeknownst to them, by doing so, they were putting a convicted poisoner in charge of managing the company's tea trolley, giving him access to each of his co-workers' personal teacups. And to the surprise of, I'm sure, none of you, it did not take long for Graham to start slipping thallium and antimony into his colleagues' beverages. It's worth noting that the thallium he was using was not procured from the actual Hadlin premises. Rather, Graham would independently obtain his poisons from pharmacies and then bring them into Hadlin to slip them to his co-workers. Even though they manufactured thallium bromide iodide infrared lenses, no actual thallium was stored on the Hadlin premises. And because no one there knew about Graham's past, no one suspected that he was slowly poisoning them all. Instead, they chalked up the nausea, upset stomach, vomiting, and diarrhea to something they referred to as the Bovenden bug, which they just assumed was like a stomach bug they were all passing around. It was also theorized that perhaps they were experiencing complications from some radioactivity present on a nearby airfield, but poisoning for sure was never on anyone's radar, which sadly would prove detrimental to some of the Hadland employees. Bob Eggle was a 59-year-old storeroom manager at Hadland, and he was also Graham's direct supervisor. And within just weeks of Graham's start at the company, Bob became his main target. He slowly poisoned him over the course of like six-ish weeks until finally on July 7th, 1971, Bob succumbed to the damage that had been done to his health and he passed away in the ICU at St. Albans City Hospital. Sadly, Bob's death was incorrectly attributed to this, which is a rapid onset muscle weakness caused by immune system and nervous system damage. Basically, it was assumed that Bob's bout with the Bobbingdon bug, God, say that five times fast. But I guess they thought that Bob's immune system had been so damaged by the mysterious illness raging through the office that he developed this syndrome and died. From what I could find, no one had any inkling that Bob could have died from anything other than complications from an illness. Therefore, Graham continued to slide under the radar, so much so that he was actually invited to Bob's funeral by Hadlin's managing director as the official representative of Bob's former department. And he went! offering his deepest condolences to those closest to Bob for his untimely passing. And it is sick to me that he could go and feign grief to those heartbroken people, knowing that they were the reason that they were all heartbroken and gathered there in the first place. He, he is just a sicko. And it wasn't enough to Graham that he just killed his boss, mind you, because the whole time he was poisoning Bob, he was also poisoning Bob's assistant, Ron, and his colleague, Diana. Graham even wrote in a journal of his once, stating, quote, Diana irritated me yesterday, so I packed her off home with an attack of sickness. I only gave her something to shake her up, but I now regret that I didn't give her a larger dose capable of laying her up for a few days. Yeah, if you haven't clocked it by now, this man was deranged. Thankfully, both Ron and Diana managed to survive Graham's sick little games long enough for him to move on and find new targets. In October of 71, Graham started poisoning a co-worker of his by the name of David Tilson. Thankfully, though, David did survive the poisonings, but he was left with permanent um, sexual dysfunction as a result of the damage the poison did to his body. And at the same time that Graham was poisoning David, he also started poisoning a friend of his from work named Jethro Bat. Much like with Trevor Sparks, Graham and Jethro actually got along really well. Jethro used to give Graham rides to and from work periodically, and by all accounts, he was always kind to him. He too survived Graham's attempts to poison him. However, he was also left with the same permanent issues that David was following ingesting so much thallium. For what it's worth, which really isn't much, but I'll say it anyways, um, Graham did show some remorse for what he did to Jethro, writing in his diary that he felt rather ashamed in his action and harming Jay. So 
And that brings us to Graham's final victim, a 56-year-old Fred Biggs. Fred was a part-time Headlands employee whom Graham poisoned with thallium on multiple occasions. At first, he just fell sick with the same symptoms as the others who suffered the Bovingdon bug. But in late October 1971, after Graham put three doses of thallium in Fred's tea, his condition deteriorated at an alarming rate. He developed chest pains and he started to ha have trouble just walking, so he was admitted to the hospital where... His central nervous system deteriorated to the point that he couldn't even speak and he had trouble breathing. His skin even started to peel off. So like I said, it got really gnarly really quick. He was transferred between, I think like four different hospitals before he ultimately passed away in late November. Now, finally, at this point, management at Hadland was like, do you think maybe something weird's going on here? And they came to this conclusion specifically thanks to Diana, who brought to their attention that Graham never seemed to be affected by the Bobbingdon bug when basically everyone else in the office had been. And Diana's theory was substantiated by a man named Philip Doggett, who told management that he was weirded out by how much Graham knew about poisons and by how much he talked about them. Infuriatingly though, at first these concerns fell on deaf ears because Hadland's medical officer, Dr. Lane Anderson, had ruled heavy metal poisoning out as the cause of the Bobbingdon bug. But all it took was a quick conversation with Graham for Dr. Anderson to change his tune. Not only did Graham have an astounding knowledge of poisons and toxicology, but the onset of the, uh, <laughs> the Bobbingdon bug coincided perfectly with when Graham had started at Hadlands. I'm laughing because my notes said Bobbingdon butt, and <laughs> apparently I'm a seven-year-old boy. Oh, get it together, woman. When Dr. Anderson presented him all this information, John Hadland himself reported their suspicions to police, and Graham was arrested on November 20th, 1971. He immediately proclaimed his innocence while in the same breath asking, which one is this for? So... Way to be cool, man. <laughs> when police searched Graham's dwelling, they discovered his large stash of poisons, which included thallium, antimony, atropine, aconitine, and digitalis. Please, oh please, feel free to just drag me in the comments because I guarantee I'm pronouncing like half those wrong. Graham's room was also let's call it concerning, which I feel like is an understatement considering that it was decked out in swastikas and pictures of Hitler and other Nazis. And the cherry on top of it all was that police also found Graham's diary in which he had detailed everything. He recorded the doses he'd administered people, the effects they'd experienced, and most chilling, whether or not he planned to let each person live. This psycho was literally playing God, and it is freaky. Eventually, Graham did confess to not only poisoning his co-workers, but he also finally confessed to having been behind Molly's death. But that wasn't to clear his conscience or to do the right thing. It was more of an effort to brag about what he'd done, considering he classified her death as the perfect murder. When asked what his motive was in inflicting so much pain on those around him, he responded coldly that, quote, I suppose I had ceased to see them as people, at least a part of me had. They were simply guinea pigs, unquote. He also then went on to plead not guilty, even though he'd confessed. I, I honestly think this whole thing was just a big game to Graham, a game that he thankfully lost on June 29th, 1972, when after less than two hours of deliberation, Graham Frederick Young was found guilty of two counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of administering poison with the intent to injure, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Upon receiving his verdict, Graham requested that he be sent to a conventional prison rather than to Broadmoor, which the judge granted. However, Graham was eventually moved to Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital, where he was busted on multiple occasions trying to make poisons out of, well, basically anything that he could. He was ultimately moved yet again to Parkhurst Prison, where he died on August 1st, 1990. An autopsy determined his cause of death to have been a heart attack, but given that Graham was an otherwise healthy 42-year-old, it's widely speculated that he either took his own life or he was killed by someone in the prison, be it another prisoner or even a prison guard that just 
didn't feel safe having him around. And I mean, if that's true, can you blame him? Disturbingly, but not surprisingly, Graham's notoriety sparked a barrage of copycat poisoners, one of which was a 16-year-old girl who brought the poisoning racket into the digital age by keeping a blog that was similar to Graham's diary, where she recorded her victims, their dosages, and their reactions. Graham's story has also been loosely featured in the 1995 film, The Young Poisoner's Handbook, as well as been the subject of an episode of Crime Stories. And to top it all off for a period of time, Graham was even memorialized in wax at Madame Tussauds. His sculpture is featured in the now defunct Chamber of Horrors exhibit next to Howley Harvey Crippen and John Haig. Hey, I did a video on him. Anyways, guys, I think that's going to finally wrap up this story for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. Thank you so much again to Alf for requesting this one. It was an absolute roller coaster, to say the least. If you happen to be watching this and you're like, hey, I've got a great idea for a case for you to cover, please fill out the case submission form that I have linked in the description box. And if you haven't already and you'd like to go ahead and subscribe to my channel and turn on the post notifications. I put out new videos every week and I'd love to catch you back here in my next one. But until then, Stay safe and have a good week. Bye, guys. Oh, my mouse. I don't know. If you can hear the train, sorry. Ain't shit I can do about it. Am I an idiot? I'll never find it. It's probably literally right in front of my face. And I'll never find it. She'll never find it. I'll never find it. Ow! <laughs> Jesus. I look like an alien. And this is- oh my god, stop it. Oh my god, you've got to be kidding me.